We have a very, very prestigious panel with a lot of experts and uh, practitioners in open data, which is quite a new and uh, uh, you know, innovative uh, field. And we're very, very proud actually to have a lot of you here with us. Rwanda has been a trailblazer in a lot of the ICT for development uh, projects. The World Bank has been honored and, and lucky to assist Rwanda in Rwanda's journey in uh, becoming a middle income economy using ICT as one of the pillars of its development, as we've been hearing over the last three years. We have a lot of colleagues here in the room that have been part of that journey, and so, so we thank them for that. Today, we're going to talk about open data. And for those of you who were here with us last June, during the Smart Rwanda days, this is not a new topic. Can I have a show of hand for those of you who were with us last June? OK, a few of you. But for those of you who were with us, this is a logical continuation of the discussion we started last June. Last June, we were looking at what makes a country smart. And all of you agree that a country that generates accurate data and publishes the, use, the useful data is a smart country. Because the citizen, the private sector, and the government learn from that data that is accessible to all. And today, we're going to reinforce that topic and hear from different, different perspectives from Rwanda, from the continent, and globally. We're going to start by the case of the Open Data Readiness Assessment, an exercise that has been taking place in Rwanda. Some of you may know about it. So we're going to talk about that first, and then we're gonna have the panelists give their perspective on open data from the uh, local Rwandan perspective or the continent. So with us, and I'll ask them to raise their hand, we have today with us Jeff Kaplan, who's an international expert in uh, RCT for development and open data in particular. Jeff has been helping us on a multitude of country. Thanks for being with us, Jeff, from uh, Washington, DC. Um, we also have with us Mrs. Chantal Ubineza, Director General of ICT in the Prime Minister's Office, and the only lady with us on the panel. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Chantal, for being with us and sharing your experience. We have then with us Rajiv Ranjan, ICT Advisor of the National Institute of Statistics in Rwanda. Rajiv, if you can, very good. Thank you and very welcome with us. So that is the first uh, 15, 20 minute segment of the, of the presentation. And then with the broader panel with us, we're very honored to have, and they will speak in that order, Mr. Paul Kukubu, uh, CEO of the East African Exchange. Paul, welcome. Paul has been a client of us also earlier uh, under his uh, hat in Kenya as the chairman of the ICT board. Then we're gonna have with us Mr. Yusuf Moranga from the Office of Statistics Rwanda. If you could please raise your hand, sir. Thank you and welcome on board. After that, we have with us Ivonne Joza, Economic and Social Statistics Division from the African Development Bank and uh, a former colleague from the World Bank. I'm delighted to have Ivo with us today. Uh, after that, we're gonna have Dr. Felicien Usangumukiza, Deputy CEO from the Rwanda Governance Board to give us the Rwanda Governance Board perspective. Welcome, Dr. Felicien. After, we'll have Patrick Kabagema, Chairman, K-Lab Innovation, who will give us the perspective from the K-Lab, private sector, entrepreneurs, etc. We have a speaker who just landed. He's from Code for Africa, from the Africa Media Initiative in Nairobi, David Lemayon. So we hope he joins us uh, as soon as he gets here. And then after that, we're gonna take a round or two of questions from the audience and have the panel answer and we'll hope to close on time at 10.30. So without further ado, oh, yes. and we are, we are so lucky to have with us the Honorable Minister of Youth and ICT, without whom this would not be happening. Please give him a hand. <laughs> Welcome, Minister. Very happy to have you with us. Um, this is perfect timing, actually, because perhaps before we start with our panel discussion, maybe the Minister can give us a little opening talk on why this is very important and what would be the impact on Rwanda. We started by talking about smart Rwanda. <laughs> so welcome. Well, I got myself in trouble. <laughs> but can we regroup? You know, we're a small group and I think it makes sense to sort of feel together. Uh, I see people a bit, um, you know, for the sake of, I see the panel is really very tight. And I think that um, as we wait for more people to come, we could feel a bit, a bit, a bit more together if we go, we get uh, closer to each other. Um, 
Thank you, Samia. Um, of course, we couldn't introduce everybody, but I think, let me tell you that in this audience we are with um, um, the CEO of the Commonwealth Technology Organization, Professor Tim Anwin. Could you please uh, raise your hand for recognition? And uh, I can't, of course, I know most of you, uh, I will not introduce everyone, uh, but I think it was important to recognize Professor Tim who's made an enormous sacrifice to be here uh, with us. Now, um, I, I didn't expect to say anything this morning, uh, but I just want to tell you that of all parallel sessions, this is the one I've been able to attend. Uh, it's, uh, it's not because the other power sessions, you know, we have smart business uh, going, going on upstairs. We've we had smart education and smart health. We've got many other very interesting sessions, and uh, it's not uh, because uh, I'm less busy this morning than the other days, but I think I needed to be here this morning in this particular session just to express uh, how important uh, this uh, uh, open data movement uh, is for us in the government of Rwanda, but also in general, anywhere and everywhere. Uh, I was hoping that I was, I was going to share a few thoughts just after listening to this panel of experts, because I'm not an expert on open data. Uh, what I just know is, is that open data doesn't come uh, as, as, uh, as a separate package from, the, from open governance. I think it has to do with um, a public sector, but also a, a private sector. I will talk to open government data more than open data in general, which is willing to be transparent, to be open, to be accountable. Uh, so Rwanda has been building its governance just in those, with those tenets in mind. And for us, open data is just, is just not um, a trend or a fad or something that we, 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 are, we are embarking on just because it is becoming increasingly popular you know, globally. It's something that I believe we've been doing with the limited expertise we've had over time without calling it that name. Now, this gives us an opportunity to have experts who can tell us why is, what is that we need to do in order to get faster and better where we wanted to do. We've always wanted to be a, a government that is uh, open to its citizen, to its client, a government that uh, leverages the investments that we have put not only in hard infrastructure, you know, ICT infrastructure, uh, broadband, and so on, but also in, uh, in what I can call soft infrastructure, human resources, innovation, um, the, 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 the investments we've made in, in collecting enormous amounts of data as part of our business, but also as part of uh, specific surveys and, uh, and censuses that we've been undertaking regularly. So we are very conscious that the data that we are sitting on in different institutions is a gold mine. But mining that gold is, is not as easy as it is to mine gold just you know, under, underground. It is, I think, more difficult, more tricky. It requires, it requires very deliberate policies, strategies, uh, programs, expertise, both on, on, the, on the supply side of it, but also on the demand side of it. So I think this panel will allow us to really look at all dimensions of the question 
Uh, we've just completed, with the help of the World Bank, that I'd like to acknowledge and thank at this point, uh, our first um, open, um, data, open data readiness assessment. That gentleman sitting on the far right of the table, right or left, I get just com very much confused be between that, depending on where you are looking. So uh, Jeff has, has really helped us uh, completing that open data readiness assessment that showed us really uh, areas of improvement. And we've said that this is something we take so seriously that we're not going just to jump into execution or implementation. We have to put in place a, pro a proper um, open data policy <coughs> uh, in which all the stakeholders have, have had a uh, you know, inputs and own, and then we'll move strongly in implementing uh, that policy and capturing the promise or delivering the promise that open data brings to us. And we know that it means a lot uh, to the government in terms of being more efficient and more transparent, more accountable. But also we know it uh, means a lot in terms of uh, the, type, the types of new services or new businesses of a whole economy or ecosystem that will get enabled as in the process. So we, we, we very much look forward uh, to the ideas that we are going to be able to generate, the momentum that we are going to be able to generate. And uh, we look forward to work with every one of you. When I look at this panel, um, I realize that we, we got everyone we need on board to make the open data agenda in Rwanda successful. Just looking at this panel, forget about the audience. Because we also have a very nice audience, um, at least the people that I can know, the institutions that are represented. We've got the Director General of National ID Authority, which is a central building block in, in as far as you know, citizen uh, identification and everything else is concerned. So let's use this opportunity. Let's really capitalize on this moment to go to the next level. Let's this workshop be another milestone towards an open uh, data uh, uh, program in Rwanda. <coughs> and you know that we want to be in the lead on this particular issue. We know that we are starting late. Uh, we know that uh, many, many other uh, countries uh, in, in, in Europe, in US, in Africa are very much ahead, but we are committed to move forward fast, very fast forward, and be among the leaders. So tell us how to, to get there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. Um, I'm going to take just a minute and before the main course, sort of set the table a little bit uh, and explain just very quickly what open data means so that we all start from the same page. And then we'll spend a few minutes, uh, Chantal and I, together talking to you about the assessment, the readiness assessment that is sort of the starting point of the process here in Rwanda. So first of all, um, what's open data? The minister uh, talked about data like gold. And uh, it's quite famously a, lot of, a way that people refer to open data as sort of the new gold. I actually, I think it's better than gold, right? Data never runs out. More is made every day. It's found everywhere, so it's not scarce. And it's much more useful. You can turn data into all kinds of incredible innovations, whether it's new applications, um, new services, improvements on products, improvements on service delivery, government efficiency. Data is a real fuel for innovation. So instead of sort of falling asleep when you hear data, I, I, I'm quite excited about it. It's amazing what can be done with it, um, put in the right hands. And so in that, in that way, it's a lot better than gold. Way more useful, way more common, and more is made every day. 
So what does open data mean? Um, in, in, in just one sentence, open data is data that is digital, it's online, it's free, that's important. It's available to anyone, so there's no discrimination as who can access it. Everybody has the same access to this data, and they can use it for any purpose they want, as long as it's allowed by the law. So that could mean for commercial use, businesses can use it, researchers can use it, the media can use it for stories. Government itself obviously uses its own data and data from others. So the idea of open data is it becomes raw material for anybody to use in any way they want. The one technical thing that makes open data open is it's in a format that we call machine readable. So what does that mean? That just means that it's in a format that software can use directly. So it's not paper. It's not a PDF file or a Word document. These are things that people read. Machine readable are formats that can be processed directly in computers and in software. So that's what open data is. It's online, it's digital, it's free, it's available to everybody to use however they want. Now, as the minister mentioned, this is actually happening all over the place. It's a global mega trend. You have approximately 300 governments around the world doing open data now. You know, five six, five, six years ago, that number was zero. So it's, it's experienced phenomenal growth. And the reason is, as the minister had mentioned, what governments realize is if they start to open up their own data so that others can have easy access to it and use it for however they want, it leads to all kinds of new value being unlocked. And so this is why this is happening. This is why Rwanda is interested. This is why a lot of governments at all levels, from national down to cities, um, are starting to really take interest and get uh, active in opening up their data. So that's setting the table. Um, what, uh, what we're going to do, Chantal and I together, is just very briefly give you a picture of the open data readiness assessment that Rwanda has completed, which is sort of, as I said, the starting point for this journey that they're going to begin. Uh, quickly, just to explain the readiness assessment, it's a, it's a methodology. Uh, the World Bank uses it. It's, been, it's being recognized now as sort of a, a good starting standard uh, methodology for countries and governments that want to start on the journey of open data. And so it looks at, uh, we call it an ecosystem. So it's not just looking at data. It's not just looking at government. It's actually looking at all of the pieces that are needed to pay attention to in order for open data to actually have impact and start cr unlocking new value. So that's things like leadership. That's things like institutions. Of course, that's data. It looks at data, the assessment. But it also looks at demand for data outside government, media and universities and private sector. It looks at the technology infrastructure that's in place in a country. So it, uh, it looks at financing. It looks at a whole number of things to look at where the opportunities are for a particular country, for a particular government, to start realizing value from open data. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chantal, who will give you sort of um, the government's viewpoint starting out on this. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, from where the minister has just ended or stopped, uh, the government of Rwanda, we don't want to be left behind in this trend. It is not just a trend for us, but it is uh, vital. So we want to tap into opportunities offered by open data. There are so many. But we have major factors that are driving the government of Rwanda in this process. First, open data is a, is a source of knowledge creation. From the vast, all the, the wide range of data that is produced by open data, and the integration of data, the integration of source of data, there is a lot of knowledge creation. And the government of Rwanda, we have a vision of transforming our country into a knowledge-based economy. So with that vision, open data becomes a top priority for the government of Rwanda. And the minister said about um, uh, improved government's efficiency. We know with open data, 
the government of Rwanda is going to be more efficient. We have more collaboration, more information sharing, which is made easy by open data. Uh, by what Jeff will say from the assessment that was conducted, you will be able to see how it is easy from one government to assess, to access data from another government institution without going through a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of uh, call and going back and forward, but just for, from the open data uh, platform, we have everything in one place. People can use and reuse data which is available without going from one place to another. And be, that creates efficiency in the government of Rwanda. Another thing is the improved public service delivery, the level of transparency becomes increased and the population, the citizen, the client, the private sector have confidence in the government and the government has confidence in the private sector. So it is vice versa. So for the government of Rwanda, we choose to do the assessment in 15 institutions, government institutions and six private sector institutions. We could not do all the institutions, but we choose 15 based we used only two simple criteria to select institution where we're going to do the assessment. Uh, first, uh, the perceived amount of data the institution has, and then the level of interaction with the other, the external client, other government institutions, the private sector, or even individuals who interact with that institution requesting data or just information. So. The assessment conducted, uh, Jeff was the lead consultant. We worked together with them and the team from the National Institute of Statistics. He will give highlights of the finding. But uh, in short, it showed that the government of Rwanda has a lot of data, which is already public online, and which is already uh, institution use data from another institution, but the data is not open in the sense of open that was defined here. And uh, opening it will add value to a business, to government business, even to the private sector and to the citizen. So the assessment will give you the, the result, a highlight or a summary of what was the outcome of the assessment. But then, after the assessment, what are we going to do? So we are not going to stop here because, like the minister said, we are committed to this open data. We want to do it properly. So we don't want to do substandard things. So we want to do it in a proper way. That is why we are preparing a policy, open data policy. And the policy, after it's approved by the relevant authorities, will give birth to implementation plan, or we will draw an implementation plan from that policy that will guide us how the open data is going to be implemented across government institutions. I think my colleague uh, from National Institute of Statistics has uh, maybe tangible example to give uh, to highlight what I just said about the government of Rwanda. Thanks. I'll, I'll just take a, a really, really short amount of time just to give you a taste of the findings of the assessment. Uh, I, I believe very shortly the entire assessment is going to be available for everybody to see. So it's, it's intended to be a public document. Um, so once it's sort of finalized shortly, it, it'll be accessible to everybody. So you, the taste, you'll be able to sort of have the whole meal. Um, in general, uh, I think that the main finding that um, and, and by the way, this was a, a partnership. The, this assessment is done by the government with World Bank support, but most of the people on the assessment team are from the government, so it's, it's, I'm, I'm representing them in what I'm about to say. Um, first of all, Rwanda's track record in improving and strengthening accountability by the government, social welfare, economic growth, business climate, which just got announced yesterday, um, that track record uh, speaks very well to the potential for open data to be implemented with impact. Meaning, what I mean to say is, a lot has been delivered already, so there's a track record 
that serves as a very good foundation for bringing and introducing open data here. So I think that's a really important starting point. And the other thing, just on a almost a political level, is uh, I think there's a really big opportunity for open data to reinforce Rwanda's brand as an ICT leader in Africa. That doesn't mean open data is just about ICT. It's not. In fact, it's really not about technology. It's more about what data turns into, innovation, growth, jobs, government improved services. Um, but it does offer a way and reinforce, I think, a brand that's already exists here. So that's important. It fits with what Rwanda's doing. That's the second um, major finding I think we found, which is you know, every country has a different mix of comparative advantages and challenges. Everyone's a, every country's different. Every government's different. Every government's readiness for open data is a little different, um, which means there's no one size fits all. And so part of what the assessment and the findings are looking to do is figure out how to connect open data to the important things that the government and the country are trying to achieve. And so here, for example, one of the things that's very clear during the assessment is, you know, Rwanda's major national development initiative, EDPRS2 it's called, I, I don't know the whole, what it stands for, Th that's their national development plan. It's, it, it represents the top initiative, the top objective of the government. And open data connects to that very well because it, that plan is about economic transformation and about transparency of the government. And open data is fuel for both of those things. Uh, the, you know, the other things that we found just quickly, the government already actually makes, as, as Chantal said, a lot of data available to the public, but it's kind of on a request basis. People can come to ministries and ask for fairly important high value data and they will get it. And it's not sold, it's provided for free. Uh, I see the, the head of uh, NIDA here, and it's a great example. So civil registry is really important, both for the government and for citizens. And civil registry information is available, and that's to their credit. They make it available when, when it's requested. Now what open data would do is scale that access. And so what I mean to say is an important finding is a lot of data is already made available by the government on request. So the shift to open data is not that big a step. They're already making it available to people. The one challenge, and it's a challenge in a lot of places, and this is the last finding I'll share with you, is on the demand side. We say open data has a supply side and a demand side. Supply side is government, in this case, making data available, opening their data. The demand side are the communities that would use that data, which could be government itself, but it's private sector, it's media, it's civil society, it's individual citizens or individual developers with an idea. So that's the demand side. and here, the demand side is, still has a lot of growing to do. And by the way, that's very typical. Supply side often is the easier place that governments start. But the demand side is really important because that's what turns data into things that are useful to citizens. That's what turns data into an application that dairy farmers can use to improve their management of their cattle and increase their milk production, as has happened in Kenya. So having people that on the demand side to turn data into things that are useful is the key connector. And here in Rwanda, that still has some growing to do. There still needs to be investment in the demand side so that media can make more use of data, so that civil society, developers, it's not just making data available. There needs to be activity and investment on the demand side, and that's still to happen here. So that's one of the sort of challenges that's still in front of us. Um, I'll leave it there because there, we're going to come back to some of these things as the panel. I, I want to sort of be able to turn it over to them. But first, we'll just let one more person from our team um, share some of his experience and perspective. Hello. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Rajiv Ranjan. I work with the National Statistics Office here um, as an ICT advisor. And uh, as Statistics Office, we deal with data. And uh, our exposure to open data happen organically. It happened naturally. Why it happened is because we try to understand what the users need. And as a statistical institution, we have been uh, very committed. We are committed to data dissemination. We have been doing it very effectively. But with the advent of uh, electronic data dissemination, we needed to do something more. Because what we were doing was we were putting publications 
in PDF documents online on our website, which we realized by way of feedback that was not sufficient. People were not able to use the data which is contained in PDF documents to do their own analysis. It was not machine readable. So what we did in the first stage around 2008, nine, we started attaching Microsoft Excel sheets with the PDF documents so that people can at least use uh, the data contained in those tables in machine readable formats and then do their own analysis. But then we did not stop there because we wanted to move ahead and wanted to make sure that the people do get data in open standards. So depending on different kind of data sets that we work with such as time series data or indicators or micro data, we went on to get specialized platforms for uh, indicators, we use platforms like DevInfo, Prognose. For microdata, we use platform like NADA or National Data Archive. Now, what these platforms do, and I'm talking it in terms of government institutions, how uh, they can do the open data, is that these platforms allow the data to be available, uh, to be accessible in machine readable formats and in open standards. So that, that is uh, one part of uh, making data available. However, we also realize that just by making data, it's not sufficient. We want the data to be used. And to that extent, what we do is, as, as Jeff said, that the, the ecosystem or the demand side, um, we organized inter-university competition among university students to compete against each other, to use the open data that we make public to do a visualization, to make that data meaningful, which is lying in charts and tables, for the policy makers and decision makers to use that data and then contribute uh, more effectively in policy making. On this screen, you can see this is the current uh, competition which is running right now. This is second in series. The first one we did in 2012. This is 2013 competition. We, uh, with this kind of competition, we try to engage uh, the user community, students, researchers, to use the data which is available out in open and uh, develop something meaningful out of it. So this is just to give you an example that how government of Rwanda and with uh, uh, National Institute of Statistics here, uh, we have started doing open data uh, quite uh, early and we uh, would like uh, to see this thing happening across the government. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rajiv, Chantal, and Jeff, for exposing to us what has been happening under the Open Data Readiness Assessment. I think this is excellent news, and it's the right fit with the EDPRS2, for those of you who know the Economic Development Poverty Reduction Strategy, the second one that Rwanda has embarked on with the set of development partners that are with the room, with us in this room and outside. So thank you very much for this very good um, summary of what has been going on. Let us now involve the audience, take a round of questions. Please, if you have any question on the ODRA, uh, implication, impact, uh, and other comments, please raise your hand and, and let us hear from you. I'm gonna take three, four questions, then we're gonna move to the main panel. So. Uh, my name is Michel Maloto. I've advised uh, the Minister of ICT on site CIO strategy, following up on uh, Nikki 3. I've also worked for the ICT chamber. And uh, prior to that, I was an advisor, strategic advisor, to the European Commission in Brussels on uh, cross-border interoperability. And I was the author of the public services framework for the European Union. So my question to you is, you're talking explicitly about open data, structured open data, and civic registries, perfect. They will be open to the private sector. They will be usable. My question is, can they also be updated by the private sector? Mm -hmm. Because if a question comes from a citizen to the private sector company, who is using that open data, for instance, somebody 
wants to relocate or uh, ask for a visa, they have to submit data. Will you allow the demand side, the private sector, to submit that data in the base registry? And what is the procedure in the public sector to verify the correctness of that data? Because it should be a unique, authentic data source. Okay, very good question on uh, the crowdsourcing of registries. We're gonna get to the answers, and we have with us uh, a few of the policy leaders in the country that may want to comment on this as well. Sir. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank the presenters for that very good presentation. Um, I, I, my name is Patrick Mwesigwa. I'm from Uganda. I work with the Uganda Publications Commission. Uh, I like the concept of open data, but I, I want to imagine that not all government data should be public. Um, if that is the understanding, who decides what, uh, which data should be open and which is confidential? I thank you. Excellent. We can take one or two more on this side, maybe. Ladies, to have gender balance. <laughs> okay, very good. Just two? Okay, we're gonna close now. Let's move on to the panel. Jeff, do you wanna take some of these? Uh, I might defer on the first question uh, because that is really specific to how the Rwandan government agencies would handle the mechanics of updating slash correcting data within their databases, whether it's a civil registry or it could be anything else. I mean, you mentioned civil registries. Um, I will say from the point of view of the work we've done thus far together, that's several steps ahead. I mean, we're not into the mechanics of how data will be versioned, you might say. Um, that said, I, I do see the head of Nita, Nita here who are in charge of civil registries and we have others from the government who might be able to speak on how they would handle updating and correcting citizens' information. Um, on the second question of who decides what data is confidential, to put it simply, um, again, there's usually policies in place that handle classification of data. Uh, I will tell you that in the governments that we work with, which is many, um, in reality, those kind of decisions about what's confidential, what's classified, what's private, personally identifiable information, which is not opened, those decisions tend to get made by each agency in advance of deciding whether to open their a particular data set or not. So in other words, they're made data set by data set. It's best if there's a process in place, an actual standardized process in place to review data before it's open, both to determine whether there's any legitimately classified information in it, or whether it's been appropriately anonymized so that personally identifiable, identifiable information has been taken out. So that kind of review before data is in fact published as open data is important. That would be a best practice. Um, and generally that is done agency by agency following hopefully guidelines and standards that are set uh, government wide. But I will defer to my colleagues on the other first issue that you asked. Great. I think for, for the second question, the, the policy provides general guidelines on how data is open. But going into details, data set by data set, then it is institutional decide this is confidential data. And normally we do, which, when it is confidential, we know we don't, we don't communicate. But which is or, the data which is already public, then there is an, we know that is public. So institution by institution, they know this is confidential, this is, can be open. But the policy, everywhere, even here in Rwanda, the policy we provide the general guidelines on how we do, how we classify data, what is secret, what is not secret, maybe, and then the, the, the management of the institution decides. For the first question, I think, but I stand to be corrected. The, the data belongs to the institution. Then the institution is in charge of updating the data. The, when the data is, if the data is open, I can reuse it, but I don't have the right to change. So I think the updating the data is, is something. It, it, it is changing the data. So uh, I think maybe the DG will will want to help us, but no matter how it is, the institution owns the data. The update is by institution. That being said, governments that do open data best 
do have a mechanism in place as part of, if it's an op on the open data portal or other channels that enable a citizen, a business, or somebody to actually help correct data. Now, when you're talking about personal data, that's probably not going to be done openly, sort of posting something on a portal as a comment. But the idea of having multiple channels so that citizens or others can actually clean up data or correct data um, is actually really important in doing open data. Now, when you're talking about updating registry data, that probably has its own issues because by definition there's a lot of personal information involved in that. That's probably going to have a different channel of communication. And as, as I said, and Chantal said, we'll defer to um, the head of NIDA if, if he chooses to respond. The one other thing, which is on transparency and confidentiality. The governments that do open data best are very transparent about what data they have, even if it's not opened yet. So they will publish an inventory of the data sets that they hold and indicate what's been opened already, what's not been opened already but could be, and what, for, uh, for reasons of classification or confidentiality, cannot be opened, and they usually will provide the legal basis for that. So they're very transparent about what's not only open, but what's not opened. Uh, and that is clearly the, what governments who do this best, that's how they do it. Well, I mean, just to reinforce what my colleagues have said, um, that in the spirit of uh, data uh, getting enriched by uh, making it open, we need to uh, take into account uh, the demand side of it or the usage side of it. And though the data which is coming out from the government institutions cannot be changed by the users, it can be used in connection with other data sets coming from various other sources and can be hosted somewhere else to increase the value of the data which was originally obtained from the government institution. So yes, I mean, uh, all the responsibility here do not lie with the government institution, but making the data useful, more meaningful, more enriched is also shared between both the government and the civil society and private sector. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's important to know this uh, iterative process. Nobody gets it right from the beginning, and it's ongoing. So once we start that whole open data um, culture, a lot of things change, and uh, there is a lot more consultation that will happen to address issues like the very specific ones we've, we've seen right now. We have an hour left, so what I'm going to suggest we do is we move to the, um, to the rest of the panel. So we'd like to start with Paul Kukubu, uh, CEO of the East Africa Commodity Exchange. Paul, from where you sit right now, where do you see the large benefits of open data? What are for you, from your perspective, the challenges, the opportunities, the impact? And are we ready for it? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> um, maybe, uh, Samir, if I can, I'll probably, maybe just uh, as I respond to your question, I'll comment on the, the readiness assessment from Rwanda, because I think I find it very interesting. And then also, I'll speak from my perspective as the current CEO of the exchange here, and also from my previous experience in, in Kenya, where I worked on the open data project. Let me just say that um, one thing that I'd like to echo is the, is the Rwanda's approach towards um, the open data as a systematic process. You know, assessment of readiness, policy development, and then implementation pre uh, preparation. I think this is very good um, because from my own experience, I would like to suggest that sometimes if you're not, um, if you're not very systematic, you can, be, you can make a bit of mistakes. You can make some mistakes. And therefore, I think I would like to appreciate the approach that is being taken towards embedding this uh, properly. And then also I'd like to um, agree with the uh, Honorable Minister's statements at the beginning about the fact that open data has to be part of um, a wider government agenda of, of transparency and accountability. And he did say that, and I, I agree 100%. And this is certainly our experience. But I want to also suggest that what governments in Africa may not be doing 
enough is seeing um, national knowledge as a, as a strategic asset. Um, we talk about por ports, we talk about ICT, we talk about roads, we talk about new airports, but I think we must put knowledge management at the same, we must give knowledge management the same status as we give any physical infrastructure because knowledge is a basis of development and self-progress. And therefore, perhaps if I can make a contribution to the readiness report, and I know it's been implied, I think we had it said that uh, suddenly Rwanda wants to be a knowledge economy and it's, it's part of the stated objectives. And therefore, I would suggest that knowledge management be part of what open data is about. Having said that, my own experience also suggests that um, citizen capacity to use data can be a challenge. You can have data out there, but citizens, even when they need to use that data, may not necessarily always be clear about how to use data. And this is a function of two things, a function of education and a function of uh, their own understanding of data and data uh, literacy. It's a complex issue. Sometimes when in my previous job, when we talked about data to communities, even when it was relevant, sometimes they didn't see relevance. So I think one of the, the biggest drives has to be how to convert data into simple, tangible, consumable units for citizens. For example, uh, a lot of data may only be saying that government sort of spends 20% on education. But for a citizen, what's the difference between 20% and 80%? Does he even know what the comparison should be? But if you say to him, perhaps that um, education is seen as a bigger priority than, say, infrastructure in percentage terms, then it can be part of that discussion. And I think how you articulate data is always going to be important. And I think um, this has to do with capacity building, but may I also suggest that it's also about culture building. Building a culture of using data in our society is very, very important. And I would suggest that if you don't do this enough, just like you do anything else, it will not be a success. Uh, because it can be very complex. And then, the, maybe as I conclude, I would like to say that um, at the exchange, what we've done is that we plan to um, provide uh, as much information to farmers as we can through whatever means, because farmers actually do better or worse on the strength of information. The only reason why a farmer doesn't get a good price is because he doesn't know a good price is there to be gotten. The only reason why farmers don't have markets is because they don't know markets are there to be gotten. So the more information and the more knowledge you give farmers, um, the better it is. Uh, illustratively, farmers benefit or, or fa farmers lose when there's a surplus because suddenly there's a lot of crop, and therefore the prices go down. And yet, they produce a lot of crop so they can make a lot of money. So there's an irony. But if they knew that they could store their product, produce in a warehouse and wait a little and get financed for their own needs and wait a little and sell at the right time, they could benefit substantially. And this kind of data should be data that is commonplace to farmers. Farmers must be developed to the extent where they take data that is important for them for granted. They know the prices of maize across East Africa. They know the prices of beans across East Africa. They know the weather patterns. They know who all the buyers and sellers are. And this, this is how it should work. And therefore, as I conclude, I must say that perhaps because this summit has an African perspective, may I also suggest that the, the use, the strategy about data must also take on regional dimensions. Uh, it's important. For example, common codes for data storage, common formats for data sharing. We talked about the fact that right now, the heads of state were having a meeting here 
at the beginning of the week to talk about infrastructure, talk about a common visa. When you, th when you say things like common visa, you actually mean data to be shared in a way that says that the citizen of Kenya and the citizen of Rwanda, when they walk, when they have a visa to, uh, when people come into those countries to visit them, we have the same criteria uh, for visitation. But that is underpinned by data. And some of that data, if you want citizens to participate, you must make it open so that citizens even understand and consume it. I think I'll say that for now, and may maybe I'll articulate a little more uh, later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for your excellent perspective. And I think uh, what Paul did today is kind of close the loop between what he said on the importance of open data as it relates to the agriculture department to what the president of Uganda told us on the first day. How do we connect ICT and agriculture? How do you use all this to create this knowledge-based society amongst the rural developers, the farmers, etc.? Thank you, Paul, for making that loop. Right now, we're going to talk to two colleagues working specifically on statistics. We have Ivo, who's coming to us from the African Development Bank and a previous World Bank colleague. He's going to give us the perspective of the African Development Bank, who has, in, who has been a very active partner in open data. Ivo, please. Um, thank you, Samir. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Ivan Josa. As Samir said, I'm, I'm from the African Development Bank. Um, I'd like to, well, actually, one of the themes for, for this discussion here was, um, um, was is if Africa is ready for, for open data. I, I, I don't know if that's been said explicitly, but uh, it's supposed to be one of the theme for this discussion. And um, I'd like to answer that a bit by, by responding to, to how the African Development Bank got involved in this. Uh, uh, two years ago, uh, about two years ago, um, in a meeting in, in, in South Africa, uh, all the African countries, a statistics meeting, 2000, January 2012, uh, uh, all the African countries, all 54 of them, made a request for, 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 for uh, a, a, a data dissemination system that was common to all the African countries. Now, in a way, I can, you can look at it that, given that the tenants, some of the, the, the components of, of open data is that you want it to be easy to use, you want it to be exchangeable, uh, you want it to be shareable, uh, you want it to be, to be machine readable. All of these are components of, of open data. And so just by that demand that they were making, uh, I think in a way it goes to answer that question if they were ready for open data. Um, for the last year, year and a half, uh, the African Development Bank has been uh, installing open data systems uh, in all the African countries and several uh, uh, regional organizations. Uh, the objective, of course, being just that, so that all the countries can exchange data seamlessly. Um, some of the countries, most of the countries have been very, very open to it. Some of the countries were already ahead of the curve, like your, 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 your Morocco, your Kenya, your South Africa, your Ghana. Some of them already had had the idea of, 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 of implementing uh, uh, open data already. Uh, 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 one of the things we noticed, though, however, is that each one sort of uh, 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 did it, 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 it following a different methodology. So in a way, we're glad to see the World Bank now come up with a common methodology that we at the ADB also would adopt and encourage all the, 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 the 54 African countries. Uh, um, Rwanda has already done it, to follow that methodology because we followed the, 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 the idea that build it and they will come. In terms of that, we just build the open data platform, the, the net, the, the, the infrastructure. We put it out there, and you know, we, we let the countries uh, decide how they will use it. Uh, but now that some of our partners uh, uh, in the international arena are coming up with, with, with content, are providing that content, uh, we, we're definitely very happy to, 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 to partner with them and continue with that. Um, uh, in the next, uh, I guess, um, uh, over time, uh, 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 during, the, in the, in the, in the, during the discussion, I'll be able to answer to, to some of the particular points that you may, may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ivo, giving us the perspective from the African Development Bank. 
Let's now move to um, Yusuf Muranga from the Office of Statistics in Rwanda to give us the perspective from Rwanda. So we've heard a bit about the Open Data Readiness Assessment. Please talk to us, Yusuf, in terms of the impact, the utility, and who will benefit most from open data in Rwanda. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Samia. Uh, uh, information is very important. Information is very important. And uh, for a long time, there's been misconception that information is for government. And I remember uh, for some time at, uh, at the National Institute of Statistics, uh, we've been trying to reach out to, to an audience beyond the government. And uh, it took some partners by surprise. Uh, government has had information for a very long time. And uh, it's only after the information has crossed over to the private sector that we've seen uh, more value from the data. Uh, we have what it takes, uh, but it's, uh, it's a process. It's a process. Uh, my colleague talked about uh, the challenge of capacity uh, to produce and benefit from the data. Uh, that is uh, a real challenge. Uh, but but we are seeing us systematically addressing both at the same time. Uh, we are addressing the challenge of making the data available. And uh, at the National Institute of Statistics, uh, we are in charge of all official statistics of the whole country, uh, both information that we have at uh, the National Institute of Statistics, but also information that is in other departments and ministries that is supposed to be official. So. Uh, We've opened up. My colleague just talked about uh, the different portals that we have that uh, can be used by uh, all users. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be spreading the capacity to, to, all, to all institutions and, uh, and departments so that they can also avail their information. Uh, there's a lot of wealth in information that is immediate, but also that tells you what will happen in the future. And uh, with most businesses, uh, you, don't, you don't conceive a business to, to work now. You conceive a business that will, benefit the, that, will take, that will benefit the opportunities that are, that are rolling out, the opportunities that are rolling out. And uh, as we build capacity for, for our users to, to, to understand the data, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things can happen. A lot of things can happen, a lot of businesses can come up, and uh, businesses that will thrive, businesses that will not fail. Because most businesses fail because of, uh, of information, of not being able to predict the future. So if you have information, if based on the information you know what will happen in the future, uh, it's very uh, useful to, to design a business that uh, will benefit now, but also in the future. So um, I think uh, uh, it's, uh, it's very important that everyone understands that open data is, is uh, very beneficial. And uh, uh, everyone should be uh, coming together to support this cause. Of course, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, our colleague from Uganda was asking, uh, uh, which data should be available to the public and which one should not be available. That has to happen. Uh, not all information should, should be out, but at the same time, all information should be out. But appropriate measures should be taken to make sure that uh, the information is not abused. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yusuf, for your excellent presentation. And indeed, over the last 20 years, we're seeing a big shift and a change of the culture in government and the public sector. In, in many of the countries we work on, you still have public secrecy acts. And this is all changing under this open data, open government. 20 years ago, a lot of the public didn't even understand what was data. Everything was on paper. And now today, with social media, with everybody having a mobile phone, there's a huge change. And within 20 years, things are changing so dramatically 
There's not enough awareness raising, there's not enough training for everybody, for the civil servants, for the citizens, for the journalists, the lawyers, the academicians. So a huge, huge change and definitely a lot of, uh, a lot of capacity building and knowledge sharing we have to keep doing amongst one another and this is one of the venues for that. Uh, now we're going to go to Dr. Felicien Yusong Gumukiza, who's the deputy CEO from the Rwanda Governance Board. So from the Governance Board agency perspective, please tell us how does that change things? How does it improve governance? What is the impact? And what are you in your current uh, hat and responsibility? How are you going to use open data? Thank you. Thank you, Samia. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, referring towards uh, DJ Yusuf said about opening data in Rwanda. Uh, first of all, I'd like to remind that opening data is first of all benefiting uh, the opening site, not a uh, user site. It, it looks as if you, you write a book and you don't publish it. <laughs> yes. Now, when you open the data, it's uh, like making marketing of our business. Uh, on the governance side, okay, maybe the one who do not know what is the Rwanda governance board is, it's an institution in charge of promoting principle of good governance in Rwanda through evidence-based research. Now, from this broad definition of RGB, you see that we need to open our data just to make marketing of what we are doing. You know, governance, uh, it's cross-cutting sector. When you see that Rwanda is leading in terms of doing business in the fight against corruption, I'm sure that we understand that it's a matter of governance. Now, when you have such a big achievement, what we need is to disseminate our findings. And again, on our side, it could be useful when we bring on the table other research institutions, international indexes on governance, I'm sure you heard about my Ibrahim Index, Transparency International, uh, Open Budget Index, so forth. But the challenge we are facing, we do not have a harmonized uh, data in terms of assessing governance in our country. Rwanda, currently, Rwanda Governance Board we are uh, producing annually, Rwanda Governance Scorecard, where we set up eight key indicators of governance we wanted to see the position of governance in the defense sectors. We produced citizen report card where we needed to see the participation, the role of citizen, how they appreciate service rendered to them. Those kind of information, they are evidence-based. And we'd like to share with our uh, partners, stakeholders, policymakers, to uh, formulate or to make analysis based on the realities we are getting on the ground. That is why for us, open data, it looks like we are really getting what we are waiting for a long period. And yesterday when I was discussing with Jeff, I was even like to go beyond the simple opening data. And I asked him, why can't World Bank introduce something like what open data scorecard around the world to assess countries how they are opening data? And again, open data people may, should not mislead because, as uh, Yusuf said, there is data which are public and we, which are supposed to be on public disposal in terms of uh, usage and so on. And of course, open data is supposed to be also progressive according to what is supposed to be useful for public. And in uh, Rwanda Governance Board, what we do, uh, we like to do to share our methodology. This is very, very key because some indexes on governance, they produce reports without even having minimum information on the country they are assessing. And we would like to share such kind of uh, um, evidence base and the methodological approach so that we can come up with a common understanding uh, on how we are assessing governance, not only in Rwanda, but also uh, around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for giving us your perspective, Dr. Felicien. Now we're gonna look more from the entrepreneur, uh, developer, 
software developer perspective. And we have with us two distinguished speakers from K-Lab Innovation here in Rwanda and from uh, Code for Africa from African Media Initiative from Kenya, right? Very good. So because, because you just arrived, David, thank you very much for joining us. Let me brief you a little bit on what is of interest to both of you. We talked a lot about the soft infrastructure. Uh, Honorable Minister Jean Philbert talked about having the right capacity to use this data in, in the right way to create services, to create apps, to innovate, to create new jobs and wealth for the country. So please, both of you, starting with uh, Patrick, give us your perspective of what is needed in Rwanda and for you, um, David, in Africa, in the overall continent, what is needed to create that ecosystem of developers, and if you had a wish list or request from your own government or from the donor community, you have here African Development Bank, you have the World Bank, you have WTO, what is it that you need to strengthen uh, the open data uptake? Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for giving me uh, the privilege to talk to, to you. Now, I want to go back a bit because uh, there is one thing that is uh, really encompassing and really important. Why are we doing what we are doing now. At the end of the day, everything that we do need to impact our citizens in Rwanda and around the world. And in Rwanda, what is our key issue? Well, despite that in the last 20 years, we have managed, the government has managed to pull a million people out of poverty, we still have a lot of challenge. So how innovation, how open data, all is going to be used to actually empower us and lift us to actually a developed country to, to allow their citizens to have a better quality of life. Now, there is one thing that I like about this industry, the IT industry, and especially in Rwanda, and I'm going to tell you why in Rwanda. But the IT industry, I think, is the only field where your brain is what matters most. It is not your investment, it is not the amount of money, it's not because you have a big name. We've seen young people with incredible innovation start from garage, from many different places, and take the whole market. And that's why I like innovation, and that's why I'm involved. So now, what are our driving principles, and why we are doing what we are doing? Number one, a gentleman yesterday uh, gave me a quote that incredible. He said, business is the only sustainable way to make an impact. And then on innovation, another gentleman told me, innovation simplifies life. So if we use both, and let's understand that IT and coding does not, is not the fundamental in changing life. It's how we code, how we impact life. And I'm going to give an example because the guys of Facebook are here. Before even Facebook, there was High Five. Anyone still hear about that company? No. Because they understood how the customer wanted to communicate. Now, the coding today, you can send it anywhere on the planet. Somebody will code. But you connecting with the customer and telling and giving him the information in the way that he wants to have it and in the way that it simplifies his life, you will get the customer. And that's what, why he became a killer application. Now, I've heard uh, locally an application I don't need to name. He said, the customer are not using it. Well, I say, it's not the customer the problem. It's the coder and the people who did the application. Anything that simplifies life and add value to you will be used. This is the pull and the push. We cannot push onto people application. We need to pull them. And when we add value, when we simplify their life, they will come. Now, we have a lot of challenges. But one of the things, and I was going to say I like being in Rwanda, is because they are, the government is really doing its role, putting the foundation policy, regulation, and law. The infrastructure. Let's not fight because I have an infrastructure and I have a lot of money, so I will not give you access, no. Let's fight on innovation. And they understood that. Now, the open data. It's going to be a partnership with the private sector. Why? Because it's really the private sector that can leverage 
this immense knowledge, this immense data that the, the government has and bring it to value in creating job, in simplify life of the citizen, in actually growing the GDP. So now for me, we are the tipping point in Rwanda where we can release and empower our people to go to the next level. And I'm gonna give you a, uh, two examples from other country. I mean, the US government has show how opening data can transform and create billion dollar industry. The GPS was an army application, they were using it. Clinton released it to the private sector. Today, in, uh, you can practically do nothing without uh, GPS app that are connected to GPS, where you are going, and immense, they created an immense industry out of that. And really, that's some, uh, something similar. The, you can imagine how many people come to the innovation center. I want to create an application for people who have, for example, diabetes. They don't know where to get the information. They say, okay, we need to go to the Ministry of Health, do we need to go to the statistical office? And that is a stumbling block. But by working with government and creating this platform that where young people with innovation, and we don't know where that innovation is gonna come. I mean, we can try to predict, but it, it can be immense. It's up to the creativity. It's really unleashing the creativity of uh, our people. And not just in Rwanda, anywhere. And by the way, you don't need to be in IT sector to be creative. Coding, let's agree, we're not, we're not fighting on coding. It is the creativity. How are we gonna connect with our customer? How are we gonna give them application and solution that will improve their life, that will add value to their life. And that's where I think the Rwandan government here is doing all the right thing, of course, with our international partner uh, to make this possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Mm -hmm. David, tell us about uh, Code for Africa and your perspective. All right. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Uh, my name is David Lamayan. I'm the lead technologist at Code for Africa. Um, maybe just a brief, Code for Africa is a citizen-focused, demand-driven, open data initiative, the biggest of its kind in Africa. So we actually have different outfits regionally, Code for Kenya, Code for South Africa, and soon to become Code for Nigeria and Code for Ghana. Um, so the soft part, uh, I like what Patrick has, how Patrick has talked about the innovation and how important it is to have the innovation coming from the private sector. At Code for Africa, we take a little bit of a different approach. We have it in communities. We have volunteers who actually come up with these innovations and how to use this data. So first of all, we start with teaching people how to use this data. So we run something called the data boot camps. Data boot camps are where we bring journalists and civil society organization members and developers in the same room. That way, we are able to now start looking at what kind of innovation can be used by the public, by the civil society, by the media. So it doesn't start with just the developer by himself with a, with, a, with a computer. It starts with a partnership, a collaboration between those who are techie and non-techie. So we're able to come up with the real innovations at a very quick rate. Second, we come up with communities. We currently run and are partners with Hacks Hackers Africa. So in Hacks Hackers Africa, it's the hacks and the hackers. So the hacks being the journalists and the hackers being the, the developers. In these communities, people are able to come together and we actually have a number of chapters all over Africa, South Africa, Nairobi. Here in Rwanda, we have a hacks hackers in pretty much very everywhere in <laughs> all over Africa. But the importance of that is that we build the community that needs to drive open data, that needs to drive these innovations within not only our newsrooms, but within civil society, and driven for the public, for the citizens. 
So just a few pointers again um, on on AFDB. I, I noticed um, uh, my fellow panelists had mentioned that they had built a platform that they, they thought they would build it and they would come. We're currently running Africa Open Data. It's the largest volunteer run open data platform. It is, it is built by volunteers, it is built by Africans, it is built for us, by us. So we have different people not only contributing to open data, but also being able to build the platform that runs it. So that way it keeps it in check. It keeps, that, it, it keeps it such that everyone, it is demand driven, such that if you want it, you build it. If you want to see it on the platform, you put it up. So just one simple example I can, I can put forward as an innovation. In Code for Kenya, we had built something called Got to Vote. It was a simple platform in which we took um, data released by our elections commission. The election commission had released this 200 page or so PDF document that had rows and had columns and, and, and you'd have to pretty much scroll through the entire row and uh, the entire document to be able to find your, your registration center where you would register to vote. So what we did is we took this data. We, we weren't asked by government or anyone. We took this data, we scraped it. We put it into machine readable format and then we created a simple platform for people to be able to click and check where they can register. Um, now, now, somebody might say it, was, it, was, it wasn't as big uh, or as complicated or as complex. But the, the kind of feedback we got was that this was so simple. This was really simple to be able to click and see where my registration center is instead of going through a 200 page document to find my registration center to be able to go and vote. And what happened? We open sourced this code. So we put it out in the public. We told people you are able to actually reuse this code and be able to actually just do what you want to do with it. What happened was Zimbabwe took it on. Zimbabwe picked the code and a team, a volunteer, a team of volunteers picked up the code and they deployed their own instance in Zimbabwe. They started using open data because we made it available to them. We made the, the platform available to them to be able to use it. Now Cameroon is picking it up. And now we are right now deploying for Malawi, uh, or rather helping Malawi deploy it because they came to us and they told us, we want to deploy it. And so now we're helping them. So other than that, we are also, and, and this is, I guess, the last point, because we do a lot, and, and definitely we, we are trying to work quickly and, and be able to expand the open data community from the grassroots, from the people that just walk in every day. Um, we actually also drive fellowships. So part of Code for Africa and Code for Kenya and the Code for South Africa, we drive fellowships. We take this individuals who are knowledgeable in data and we plug them into media organizations, into civil society organizations, and we show them how open data is able to help them. And I think that is all I can say for now, um, so I, can, I don't take too much time. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. You gave us both your perspective, and I think that whole panel is very representative of the open data ecosystem in Rwanda, in Africa, and globally. And I'll get, I'm going to get back to you to kind of for a second round of question to kind of see the linkages be between all that has been discussed. So thank you very much, panelists. I, I want to recognize somebody before we forget. Uh, Claude Migisha, please raise your hand. Please give him a hand. He's been coordinating this panel. Thank you, Claude. Brilliant job. We will thank the panelists as we end. But now I'd like to take another round of questions. I hope you warmed up. And uh, uh, we start with the gentleman in blue here. Hi, I'm Shri from IEEE. A uh, lot of discussion seems to suggest that the data is owned by the government. Within IEEE, we have something called open access journals. Yeah. 
so we are trying to provide data uh, mostly technology related data to the wider use of public which is free access uh, so i think the concept that the data is always owned by the government is pro i don't know whether open access and open data mean the same i would like to hear your thoughts and if it is the same then i would like to say that it's all data is not owned by the government um, also i think in india they had a particular initiative and this is just a comment not a question a right to information act i think i would like to hear your perspective on right to information act along with open data thank you very good and as you know ieee is another one of the partners to involve in this discussion as they are indeed critical to standard settings sir thank you my name is aniset uh, so the concept of open data uh, uh, like a minister says is in somehow new for us but uh, it's not new for some others who have had it before but I'm asking, let uh, take the panel a little bit before again. Uh, you talk about the open data, but a country like uh, Rwanda or any, any other country has like a website. They have the website, they have the national portal, where you can get and extract some information you want. So I want to know exactly what's new to open data. We have those kind of tools that can give you the information you want, but what is so new to, op to the open data? Very good question. A government that already has a government portal, a lot of data out there. What is new? Good. Lady there? Oh, um, lady and then uh, the director. I'll be back to you. Thank you. My name is Janet. Uh, you've been, the panelists have been talking about uh, open data and development and um, job creation. Now in Rwanda, as we have the, the high rate of unemployment, how open data is going to help people to access job, uh, maybe for the rural area where we have the big number of population who are still poor and illiterate, if you can explain more for us. Very good question. Um, the director of the National ID, Uh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Pascal Nyamulinda. I'm the Director General of the National Identification Agency uh, in charge of national IDs and uh, civil registration. Uh, I would like to make some comments in the national ID uh, perspective. Um, first of all, the national ID uh, has a national database which uh, now uh, has around 10.5 million of records. Uh, these records, which uh, const constitute the National Population Registry, uh, are uniquely identified through the, what we call the National I uh, Identification Number uh, and the Application Number. The, National ID number for people age 16 and above and application number for people less than 16. That is one of the principles for the national ID to make sure that every person, every citizen is uniquely identified through the collection of this biometric, biometric data we, we use and for Rwanda we use the fingerprints. That is the, the main principle to support all this concept of a unique uh, identification uh, here in Rwanda. Uh, now, uh, if, we, we, if we talk about the concept of open data and uh, consider it in this uh, perspective of the national ID, we are yeah, sometimes brought to, to, to to know if those data of those records are open data or not. If you look at the, uh, the definition given by, uh, 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 by Mr. Kaplan, open data is digital. In this case, the national ID data is, it, it may be uh, open data. We, it's also online, uh, machine readable, but in some 
parts of the, de the de definition, for example, the national ID is not uh, available and is not free uh, to be given to any, any, a, 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 anyone. As a matter of fact, for example, if you have at home, because I'm in the uh, everyday business in this managing this uh, national ID data, if your houseboy at home still, uh, for example, money or some stuff at home, <coughs> and you come to me and say, I need uh, the picture of this man, the, my, my houseboy, I need his phone, I need this, these details. You will not get those information. You will not get those, those information. In this case, the, this, the national ID data or details are not open. Uh, they are governed. Someone uh, was uh, asking uh, what, what is open, uh, what is not open. But for in the case of national ID, these are private private data. Um, and what, I, uh, what is uh, for the nation, national ID uh, is support as uh, the first layer of the entire system integration just for online authentication. In, in, in this case that's where I can say in the, the system integration, ICT system integration perspective, national ID serves as uh, a main or a key uh, layer of many layers of the system integration. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, national ID now is linked to 11, 11 um, uh, institutions, including the immigration, police, uh, RDB for business registration, um, um, electro Commission, National Electoral Commission, the Land Center, the uh, MTN, Tigo, Airtel, to authenticate online uh, the client or the citizen since all services are people-centered or citizen-centered. So before you serve the person or the citizen for any client, he has first to be authenticated and online authenticated and uh, all based on what we call the unique identification. Uh, that's why I say this national ID has a strong backend system managing uh, uh, 10.5 million of data, but I can say that they are not open, but they can serve as uh, a, a layer of systems integration for different institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Director. And I think we heard here a little bit about uh, simplification, right? How to simplify to citizens these different services from different agencies, consolida consolidating them around the unique ID. So the citizen, once he or she identifies themselves, has access to the different services they are entitled to, right? Yes, uh, so far the national ID is, uh, is, is linked and uh, interfacing with different public institutions. But in the perspective, um, there are many stakeholders, including the, uh, some institutions, uh, Ngali and others, uh, which are looking at different possibilities to create a national portal, a government portal, to allow a citizen through the portal, the national portal, the government portal, to get some services uh, from, uh, from the national ID. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to address my question to the last panelist, uh, the gentleman from Code Africa, or Code Kenya. Uh, well, I'm right down behind here, okay. Uh, your innovation sounds very, very good, and I'd like to applaud you for that. Thank but I would like to understand what are the economics behind it? Uh, how would one obtain the kind of, um, of uh, st structure or what you put out there? Uh, what are the terms and conditions of, of getting that? Are you doing it on a charitable basis, or are there some returns on investment that you expect to, to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to take one last comment. I think it's from Claude. 
and then we're going to go back to the speakers. And as Claude gets ready, sir, you raised a very good point. We heard a lot of these activities funded by African Development Bank, World Bank, Code, um, Code for Kenya, Code for Africa. Where is the money coming from? How long do you keep these guys and girls as volunteers? I mean, they need to eat. Where are the formal jobs, etc.? So let's hear a little bit from you, Claude, on this. Yes, I wanted to intervene about a question from the lady in the audience. Uh, when you talk about job creation, I wanted to show how open data can have an impact on job creation. So there's this new trend of micro work, online jobs, where someone seated in Rwanda can do some work for a company based in the US. So some of the companies are now understanding how they can open their data. So for example, there are some online platform, there's like uh, Summer Source, there's Odesk. When they avail their data, someone seated in another area, as long as you're connected, you can access their data, analyze the data, uh, do some statistics and send them the work and they pay you. So I think that once uh, we are connected and the data are on, available, people will be able to do some good work with the data. That's what I wanted to, to intervene with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claude. So we go back to our distinguished panel. We heard six questions and comments. Um, in the order we started, please go ahead, give us your, your few thoughts on what you heard. Just address the questions you feel comfortable addressing. We start with you, Jeff. Okay, uh, I'll take uh, a couple of them. The first one on open access in journalism. It, it actually raises a very important point. Uh, open data is not only about government data being open. Now that's generally what um, this panel has been talking about. But in fact, anybody can open data. So you see uh, around the world companies, for example, opening up their own data that they have um, <coughs> for specific business purposes, and I'll give you a couple examples. So Nike, the shoe manufacturer and, and uh, sports apparel, sports clothes, they are opening data connected to an initiative called Nike Plus, which is connecting their customers and their customers' exercise and everything to Nike products, and Nike has this platform which allows people to kind of track their exercising. They are opening up their own data about their products and combining it with data that is contributed by their customers. And that's a really interesting way of the company using open data, connecting it to the data from their own customers. So there's their customers opening up their data about their daily activities and exercise as a way of deepening this connection between the company and its customers. Similarly, there's another company, uh, there's a lot of examples, I'll just give you one more. A company called Yelp, which is a way for people to give reviews of restaurants and services that they get. So this has a lot of crowdsourced information. People, I go to a restaurant, I write a review. How was the food, service, everything. Yelp is also combining this customer provided information with data on um, health inspections of restaurants or inspections of service providers in certain regulated industries as a way of providing their customers more information that the customers want to make decisions about where to go to eat and who to hire to fix things. So they are also combining open data with customer data where they provide the platform, Yelp is a platform, and uh, that is a way of pr providing more value to their customers. So it's not just about government data. In fact, companies are doing it too. Um, there are media organizations which are being more accessible to their data. Um, citizens as well could do it. I mean, any, anybody, sorry, anybody could. Uh, on the right to information, someone asked about the right to information. Um, you know, one of the, it was something that was looked at as part of the open data assessment here. Um, right to information, access to information is a really important foundation in this whole sort of information access space, and open data is part of that space. So, what does that mean? A country, for example, that doesn't have a right to information or, or an access to information act that's effective. It's one thing to have it on paper. It's another thing to have it be effectively implemented. That would be a weakness in readiness for open data, I would say. So in the case of Rwanda, it's sort of that's in motion. There's an, a right to information. There's an access to information law, a transparency information law, which exists. It's recently enacted, so it's new which means that its implementation is just starting. So for, uh, for Rwanda, that's something in progress, but it's important that that progress turn into real implementation of that law because, especially for ministries and agencies, 
if they know that citizens have an effective right to access information, that is a much better starting point to have a discussion about ministries opening up their data, even themselves proactively, when they're not asked to. So they're kind of two sides of a coin, but they're very much connected. So I'll, I'll, I'll stand on the, those two and let everybody else deal with the other questions. Okay, I want to react on the question about uh, uh, the, the availability of government data on our websites. That is true, most of our data, our government data is posted online on the government's website. We have the national portal, we have Rwandapedia, which was supposed to be launched yesterday. It was launched. Yes, we have a lot of information online. But the, the, the critical issue is not that information is not machine readable. So if I want to add value to that information, I need to rework on the data. I, need to, I have some work to do. So I cannot do some computation. I cannot reuse it. I, the machine cannot read and provide me, uh, for example, I cannot do calculation. I cannot do... I cannot build an application on top of that. I need to do the work again. I need to, to take that data and put it in a, in, a, in a format the machine can read. So that is why we say it. The, 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 for the government of Rwanda, we are not far because we are, have already the data which is online, but it is not machine readable, which is a condition for open data. So if I, someone wants to use it, it will require it requires uh, additional work. For example, we have, uh, you ha we have information for natural resources. We have maps. But if I want to use that map for a business, I can't because it is, I, the, the, it, the machine cannot re read it. So I need to have a readable map if I want to build something on top of that. So the information there, the data is there, but in a format that the machine cannot read. So we are going to, to, to move from where we are. We are not far. And then have another step to open that data so it can be machine readable. OK. Uh, in terms of open access, uh, yes, uh, journals which are sponsored by public institutions must be available for people to access openly. But open access and open data are two different things, actually, here we are talking about. Uh, and they are contextual, actually. I mean, just like open source is not open data, uh, similarly, open access is not uh, open data as well. So they are governed by different kind of uh, set of rules. Um, and here, I mean, specifically, uh, we are talking about the data which is open. That is one part. Second part about, um, uh, and actually answering the other question about the national ID card. Uh, privacy is very important in, in uh, what we do with open data. We, we have to be very uh, careful about not to uh, disclose personal information, IP rights, things like that, uh, to encourage the healthy competition and, and protect the privacy of citizens. So that's the consideration that we always have to make. Thank you. I think, I think mine will just be a comment. and. Um, Maybe just to emphasize uh, the issue of what machine readable actually means, because this is what most citizens will not understand. Um, it's basically the idea that once you get that data, it's in a form that you can just use um, without having to sort of um, re retype in the data. That's how we explain it. Because sometimes we, 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 in my previous job, we used to have, like, say, for example, um, school performance by district. That, that, means that, machine, that, that, that information is in the newspaper. But if you have school performance by district in a computer, I can just go and run a graph to see which, which district has done the best, which schools have done the best, and therefore I can decide which school do I want to take my children to based on performance of results. So I, I, have, I can interact with the data in an intelligent way. And I think this is part of what I was saying earlier about the fact that most, most because most of our citizens across East Africa don't live in a sort of in a software world, we, we also need to have people who sit in between citizens and the, and the d data holders. Uh, what the open data people call information intermediaries who provide 
uh, intelligent interpretation of, the, of these efforts. And this could be university students, um, this could be uh, data enthusiasts, this could be software developers, policy makers. Uh, a good example is what Code for Africa is doing. Even in the most intelligent organizations, it is our experience that even in corporations, the use of open data and the use of data generally is not always understood. Forget about even common citizens, even by decision makers who run organizations, the use of data is not always understood. So this is a journey, and I'd suggest that um, uh, it can be taken as we go along. Now, I want to also comment on the um, National ID Project. And when I heard you speak, I, I was not surprised that of the three countries in, in the tripartite infrastructure meeting, I think Rwanda was chosen to, to spearhead the ID project, if I'm correct. And the reason for this is simple, because when I look at the way the project is done in Rwanda, it's, it's obviously that there's, there's a leadership that Rwanda has shown in the use of the national ID. I think the example you gave about the fact that 11 institutions are connected is something that other countries are dreaming of doing. I remember most of our open uh, data enthusiasts used to dream about a day when this could happen. May I suggest something, uh, perhaps, and I'm sure you know this, uh, but this is going to be a suggestion about extending this further. Um, if you look at the link between that data as core data, and I know we've talked about security and privacy, but you know there's, there's ways that you can provide uh, what, that, the, what that data means without giving out the data itself. Yeah? You know, you, there's ways to do it where the meaning of the data is, is, is shared without giving out any security details. It can be a very big driver of uh, commercial activity, very big driver of innovation. If I'm doing an e-commerce platform and I want to develop a payment system, and that payment system is tied to uh, authentication of individuals, you already have the database I need. If I want farmers to, for example, receive fertilizer subsidy, and I want an identification of that subsidy, I mean of the individual by, once he receives that subsidy, say through SMS, already we have the data sitting with you that can make that happen. So the reason why I talked about what I did earlier is that national knowledge, I, my personal view, and I've shared this even in my previous job, is that open data should be seen in the context of not just openness, but in the context of creating an intelligent knowledge-based society. And I think that example is a very good example. The data may not be open, but the fact that some of it is accessible has created national intelligence which can be very, very powerful for citizens. Um, I have a project at the moment where we will be uh, when, farmer, when, when, we, when we get around to it, in maybe in a couple of months or a couple of years, when farmers bring produce to a warehouse, um, they get a warehouse receipt issued to them against the produce that they've got in that warehouse. Now, if, with, with a system like this linked, it means that I can verify immediately who that farmer is. And if I need to pay him through an electronic method, it's very, very simple. And there's very many examples I can give you which have been facilitated by uh, that example. So for me, that is a very good example of extending the whole notion of data and data availability. And I think this should be emulated. Because governments, and I must say this, government leaders, government leaders sometimes are wary about open data discussions when the discussions are not framed in the context of relevance. Because they see all you're trying to do is ask a government to be, to give out data. So sometimes when we make the connections, and I, I, I used to be in government before, when you make the connection, government leaders start to sort of listen and say, I now see this, how this can relate to, to, um, to a citizen on the ground. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Paul, for your key takeaways. Ivo? Um, on the question on, uh, and I guess they've touched on that, um, on how the, um, how does open data help uh, people um, um, access jobs? I think that's how, how, it, how it went from Janet, I believe. Uh, just to give you the example of, 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 of what happened in, in the US, because um, quite often um, we can use that, we can look at people or countries that are a bit ahead of the trend and try to, to, to replicate uh, some, of their, uh, some of their successes. 
uh, you know, companies like, like Google, um, uh, Facebook, um, um, Yahoo, the whole GIS industry actually, uh, the weather, all of it is based on open data. And, and, and so it, I think in the US it's worth about, it, it's, a, it's a $100 billion industry a year, $100 billion. Imagine if you were to replicate that in, in, in Rwanda, we will all be happy people. So, so yes, open, if you were to start writing applications, again, that innovative ideas that my colleagues here have talked about, imagine that you start to develop it here in Rwanda. I mean, it creates jobs. Every application may have five, seven, 10, 100, 1,000, a million people to support it. So that's how it creates jobs on a direct sense. Um, and so clearly the African Development Bank, since you know, we, we encourage development, we, 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 we do strongly encourage that innovative spirit. Um, so there was a question about the challenge of finding um, uh, um, data, I believe, um, on, 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 on a government website that's supposed to be open. One of the reasons that we 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 coming up with the same platform for all 54 African countries and, and a lot of regional organizations is that everybody has the same user interface. So if you're looking for for for, for data in, in in Rwanda or in Egypt or in Cameroon or in Lesotho, you all have the same user experience. You go to the same step, it's the same thing. There's no learning curve. What works here works in Senegal, works in Sierra Leone, and so on. So it encourages you to be able to even do cross-country comparisons, cross-country cross, cross, cross analysis. Again, because you've learned how to use the software. Um, I think that's the only one that I, I, I think I, I just Excellent. wanted to add something. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you, Igo. And I think we all learned a lot from your presentation about the platform. So I encourage all of us to look at what exists already instead of reinventing the wheel, as we often do. Um, please, Mr. Yusuf. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sami, again. I think uh, I'll be very brief. The most important thing uh, is, uh, from what I've heard, is jobs, to compliment my colleague. Uh, there is the direct way that many people look at it, and that's also available. Uh, you go on the open data, try to look at uh, what job openings are there, try to analyze what fits you, and then get the job. But uh, the real power is in getting the information, look at opportunities that no one else has ever seen, create an idea, create jobs, gradually improve the productivity of those jobs. That's where the real power is. Thank you. Mine is just simple to add a short comment. Um, it seems that the open data project it's, it is not known by many, many people. Meaning that what we need, it looks like we need some kind of uh, company awareness for researchers, policy makers, even users, so that they can understand the importance of having open data. Even now, when you, you compare in a recession, when you compare to prior recession, attendance, it seems that they do not have interest or they do not have uh, many information about open data approach. Meaning that at national level, I'd like uh, maybe to suggest that uh, this kind of campaign should be led by a, a, institute, a national institute of statistics to inform, to sensitize the importance of open data, both for researchers, users, and policymakers, so that we can have really a good uh, result. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have uh, two comments here. Uh, but the first one, I want to go back to the purpose. Why do we need uh, open data? And I, say, and I will say that we need data that is accessible anytime, anywhere, on any device to fulfill what purpose? Usefulness, simplify our life, or give us insight to decide, as Mr. Michel Malotto told me. Now, on the thing about government owning or disowning, once we understand the purpose and why we are doing that, then there's no government, there's no private sector, there's no civil society. If we're going to add value to our citizen, then we understand that we need to share the data. If we're going to improve their life, then we need to share those data. 
But then there is a context that we should not underestimate. It is contextual within the culture and the society where we live. And that's why you cannot import what the West is doing or America and just blindly apply it in Rwanda or in China or in Africa. We have specific culture, understanding, and taboo. And it's within those boundaries that we need to limit this open data. As long as we have the purpose and we understand our cultural limit and our society, then this government, private sector, civil society, and all the discussion will be removed and will work together toward the purpose of adding value and quality of life to our citizen. Thank you. Um, uh, hi. Um, so thank you for your questions. They're very, actually, as, uh, as our moderator told us, these are very important and pertinent questions that we have been asking ourselves as we build innovations in Code for Africa. So just a fast one, and a quick one, because um, I think my colleagues had answered this, is that open data and open access are more or less complementary terms. Um, open data means that you are releasing data to the public to be able to access it freely. Um, and open access means being able to access this data, mainly uh, documents, um, in a free and open manner. So they're more or less complementary terms. Um, they're used uh, in different uh, sort of uh, fields or different circles. Um, open access mainly in research and open data and now where we are. Um, so that's one. Uh, on the second question, and I think this was a brilliant question, the high rates of unemployment uh, and how we're going to solve this. And the question was particularly geared towards these people, these individuals, do not have the right kind of education. They don't have the right kind of skills. They don't have the kind of resources to go to. A, they don't even, they don't, they're not even literate, as, as it were. Uh, am I correct? And how do you solve the problem that, uh, how does open data solve this? How does open data therefore go to the grassroots and solve this? I want to say this, if you want to, uh, if you want to grow a tree, you plant a seed. Open data, and this is, this is connected to your third question. Open data, and today, has provided an unprecedented level of information, of the way we, we perceive information or data in our history. So we are able to see where are the pain points? Where does money need to be put in? Where is money being siphoned out? So let me, let me put it this way. In Kenya, we recently lost 300 billion Kenya shillings. 300 billion, gone. Um, it's, it's about, if, if I put it, it's about 20, no, not 20. It, it, it's a lot of money. <laughs> Let's put it down. It's, a, it's a, over a billion dollars, actually. Yes, over a billion dollars was lost from our government this past financial year. That 300 billion Kenya shillings or over $1 billion could have been put to build the schools that would reduce the literacy. Could have been put to build the hospitals that would save our children from, not, uh, from dying. It could have been put into the businesses, into the entrepreneurs, into the road networks. 300 billion Kenya shillings. Now, to save this money, you have people combing through this data, through spending data, through budget data, being able to see, you know, thousands upon thousands, instead of just government officials, you have the citizens themselves engaging and interacting with this data and finding the pain spots. I mean, while we were, while we were building, uh, when the open data was launched in Kenya, w they, we managed to build a portal that looked at constituency development fund data. Now, what this did was that we provided this constituency development uh, fund data uh, to, the, to the people. And immediately we saw one million Kenya shillings was spent on a classroom. And somebody came back and told us, no, there's no classroom that was ever built. 
this money was stolen. What kind of return on investment or economic benefits does Code for Africa have? Or the, 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 kind, of, the kind of volunteer run um, organizations we're doing? Um, one, this, this kind of volunteers are usually uh, media journalists. So they're able to tell better stories and get better salaries, one, period. With the data, they, they, they do a better job than their peers. Two, um, to be able to, to come, well, it, citizen run, just like Ubuntu or, or the Linux Foundation, it, they're volunteers and they take their time and they're citizens who try and help uh, whatever the community is doing. So that is how we can return on investment, by building stronger and more sustainable ecosystems not just your own. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all our speakers. Give me one minute, please, to summarize, and then we have to leave because the coffee is calling. First of all, panelists, discussants, it was excellent. Thank you so much. Let's give them a hand, please. Thank you so much for all your feedback, your different perspective, which help us kind of get a better view instead of this very fragmented approach that we started with. My takeaway within a half minute, this is not a fad, it's happening. We're all changing, societies are changing in Africa, in Asia, in, in Europe. We are having much more in common now than ever before. There is no, for instance, LinkedIn for Rwanda or the US. There's no Facebook for Kenya or France. Our kids are growing with the same culture at a way that was unprecedented before. Now, how do we get there? That, that kind of new world, that new DNA. We're starting. It's true open data is new. And nobody here can pretend to say they know it all. We are learning by doing. We're learning from mistakes. We are sharing candidly from failures and successes. So I want to thank all the panelists for all the um, frank and honest discussion that were exchanged. This is very useful. Some very practical things. There's a lot of stuff that exists already. Training material, platform, standards. Please do not reinvent. Use what exists, and it is our duty as financiers and donors, as private sector, to make sure that there's a lot of transparency around what, it, what exists, so we put our money and energy on scaling up and implementation. So it reaches every journalist, every developer, every civil servant in every country we serve. Very practical thing from the World Bank. We finance a lot of IT open data projects. I want to see in the procurement requirement, machine readable. I don't want any more closed format or PDF. Please make sure you have that. And if you don't have that, we can help you get it done. Shared services, shared identifiers, registries. Uh, innovation is simplification. Very, very important takeaway that I hope we, we can use. And I uh, want to thank you all for being with us, for sharing your questions and your comments. We still have till lunchtime to exchange thoughts. So let's now give a hand for our public and invite you for coffee.